Thank you very much, Joe. Um, all right, so uh, preliminary uh, bit to my talk here. Oh, I guess the first thing I should do is just apologize to everyone that we actually have two polyfold lectures on the same day. Uh, I sort of feel that's uh, a little bit cruel, but you know, what can you do? Um, the second thing I want to point out is that, uh, so at this web address here um, uh, is sort of the, there's an outline to all the polyfold talks. And it has a decent amount of information. In particular, it's got abstracts that can be found on the ITS website but also a decent amount of lecture notes. So my lecture notes for today's talk, for instance, are on there already, and tomorrow's talk. Uh, and uh, soon from uh, my talk on Wednesday, they'll be there as well. Uh, we're hoping to add up, uh, if someone writes up uh, Katrin's lecture notes um, in a semi-readable fashion, I can put those up there. And I'm fairly certain I'll have helmets uh, up there on, uh, by the end of the week, so if you want to follow along. In particular, uh, last I heard, Helmet's talk was going to be uh, a slide talk, and so I should be actually be able to have the slides up there as well. So when he goes too fast, you can quickly backtrack on your laptop or iPad to see what the heck he was talking about. So there's a fair amount of stuff on there. In particular, there's going to be homework problems. Those are already posted. Um, and references. So there's links, for instance, to all the HWZ papers on polyfolds, so you can sort of quickly access uh, a variety of stuff that's, that's referenced. So, so that's uh, preliminary information to my talk. Um, Right, and so then just also briefly before I actually get into it, the stuff that I'm sort of talking about, you know, uh, <clears throat> before I start talking about the SE calculus, I think, you know, there are these words being thrown around like, you know, polyfold, polyfold theory. So I think it's a natural question to ask kind of what is a polyfold? Can I have some vague idea before we sort of continue? And so I thought I would, I thought I would write this down just as kind of a guide in case you're sort of confused. So, um, so I want to answer this question, what is an m-polyfold? I want to answer it vaguely but kind of give you some idea. And so to do that, I'm going to say, well, it, uh, an M polyfold, it's, it's like a Bonnach manifold um, in the sense that it has local charts and so forth. It has potentially boundary and corners. And it's a suitable ambient space to do this regularization procedure. Right? This is kind of the, um, it's like the space of like the space of all possible maps with the right topology on it, which allows, uh, you know, nodal, allows um, curves in gromov witten to develop nodes. It allows floor trajectories to break. Uh, and in particular, it's possible to build um, bundles over these for which uh, the Cauchy-Riemann operator is a section, and we can do this regularization procedure. So, but the key idea is that it's, well, it's like a Banach manifold with boundary and corners, but it has better structure, and we'll see, well, better in some sense. It has more general structure, which allows us to do uh, more things. And then, and then also this key point here is that an M polyfold is to a manifold what a polyfold is to an orbifold. Right, so, you, uh, so, so what's the difference between a manifold and an orbifold? Well, essentially, it's having this, uh, a local group action. And in the same way, that's the difference between an M polyfold and a polyfold. So the, dis the discussions this week are all going to be about uh, M polyfolds, and then it gets built into sort of the larger, more general polyfold framework uh, next week when Helmut talks. All right? So this is just to give you kind of an, you know, some sort of a vague idea as we, as we move forward. Right, so in, uh, in my lecture here, I want, I, I, I want to talk about the SC calculus. And so to get there, though, I want to start with a motivating problem. Uh, and I guess, let me just make a quick note to myself as to when I'm supposed to finish by. OK, so motivating problem. So here's a motivating problem. We want to consider the, the maps the continuously differential maps from the circle into the real line or real valued maps from S1. Um, and I want to put a group action on this. And I'm going to define this group action um, essentially by saying that, well, G applied to, say, S comma F is equal to F S plus whatever the input is. So it's essentially just a shift map in the, uh, in the, in the domain of your function F, right? And so, or, a repar or you can think of this as a, as a reparameterization action. And so now I can say, well, claim, and this, you know, I think, I think Katrin will probably tell you that this is the most important part of my talk, uh, is that G is not classically smooth as a, as a function. And by classically, I mean it's not Frechet differentiable, for instance. So in fact, 
we can make a slightly stronger statement, which is that uh, claim G is nowhere C1 proof. Well, it's a homework exercise. OK, now that's a little bit cruel. Um, simply because if you start with this, especially, especially if you don't think you know, doing a lot of analysis is fun, um, this might seem just a touch overwhelming. So I wanted to give you some ideas as to why it's not uh, anywhere differentiable. So <clears throat> you should start with at least a little bit of intuition when you look at this, right? And your intuition should basically be the following. If I look at this map and I say, OK, well, if I want to vary f, you know, that's fine. I, I vary f. But if I vary s, then I, I'm varying in the domain of f. And in particular, then, if I differentiate with respect to f, s, if I differentiate with respect to s, then I end up having to differentiate my argument. And that's a bit of a problem. I mean, in particular, if f is just c1 and no better, and I try and differentiate, right? Then I try and differentiate with respect to s, then I'm going to have to differentiate f, and that's going to kick me out of my space, and I'm going to have problems. So this at least is intuition, right? But we can be more precise than that, because this is a stronger claim. This is nowhere differentiable. So why not? So let me give the ideas. So outline. Well, step one is to say, let's suppose it is differentiable. Then the derivative, dg, well, it has to exist. And it can be computed via computing directional derivatives. So then in particular, if you make that computation, you say, well, then dg at the point sf in the direction sigma phi. Well, after you make this computation, you can see that this quantity here has to be equal to, uh, let's see, sigma f prime of s plus something plus phi s plus something. Great, OK, so, so what? Well, differentiability then guarantees that Yeah, this is a derivative of f with respect to its input. This is the derivative of f. Well, because I'm differentiating with respect oh, to oh, s. Sigma is the, oh, sorry, sigma is the derivative of the s direction. Yes, sorry. So the following, equa the following uh, uh, equation must be true. The limit as sigma comma phi tends to 0, 0 essentially in the C1 topology of the following g of s plus uh, s plus yeah, sigma f plus phi minus g of s f minus d g s f uh, sigma phi.
right? So this inequality must be true, right? This is essentially what it means for, for to have our derivative be sort of this approximating linear map. So this, this inequality here has to be true. However, what you then do is you tinker a little bit and you say, well, consider a family of functions. which I'm going to write as phi sub sigma for sigma in 0, 1. And it essentially, it essentially has the following form. So this height here is sigma squared. This is s. This point here is, I think I want sigma, 2 sigma. This point here is sigma. Uh, and in particular, as a consequence, you see the slope here of my, of my function, phi sub sigma prime uh, is equal to minus sigma. And here, phi prime of sigma is equal to sigma. And then uh, we want, this, we want the, the, these functions, this family of functions, to be in, uh, in C1. So we sort of round out the corners just a little bit. That point is more or less irrelevant to the key fact, which is the following. Sigma phi sub sigma goes to 0, or I guess 0, 0 in C1, but star does not hold. In other words, if I plug in this, this, this family of pairs into this, into this right-hand side here, and then I pass to the limit, I don't get 0 the way I should. Uh, and this is, sorry, this is uh, under the assumption that star does not hold when do, 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 do. SF is equal to 0, 0. And that's actually not too difficult to check, right? So if you get bored with the rest of the talk, you can go ahead and try and work out this example. And then the point, and then the point is that to finish off my, my claim, that G is nowhere dense, uh, sorry, that G is uh, nowhere differentiable uh, is just a matter of, of, of shifting this point around, like make this point more general, right? So then it's sort of not too, too difficult, especially if you can see why this is true, then it should be the case that you can do the work necessary to prove the more general case. And the conclusion then, just to emphasize, as I suggested that Cashman would think it's the most important part of my talk, is that this, this reparameterization action here in this toy case, uh, this action is not classically differentiable. Period. So you, if you have a reparameterization group acting on your space of functions in general, that, that will not be smooth in a classical sense. So something has to be done about that. Any questions so far? I'm not sure I entirely agree with Katrin's estimate, maybe, but uh, but I suppose I have spent a lot of time locked in Starbucks working on this stuff, so that may count for something. Okay. So so I have a question that if I were seeing this stuff for the first time, I I, I might ask. So my question is, so what? Right, so I have, to, I have this toy problem, right? I said the, this reparameterization action isn't classically smooth. Well, well, so what? What's that relevant to, to anything, right? So let me give the following. Let me give the following example. So here's a point P, and here's a point Q, and you can put these in some fixed manifold or Rn, whatever you want to do, right? And suppose it's the case that you're considering trajectories that sort of in, in minus infinity time limit to P and positive infinity time. Uh, limit to q. And in particular, maybe you define some, some space of functions. So let's consider the space of, of C1 functions mapping from uh, r into, well, whatever my target is here, I'll just name it w, uh, such that maybe I should put a, a gamma here, such that gamma in minus infinity equals p and gamma in plus infinity equals q. And the reason why one might 
want to do that is say, for instance, you have some, uh, some, some Morse function and P is a Morse index uh, one critical point and Q is a Morse index two critical point and you want to count gradient trajectories between the two. And so maybe here's one, but there's some sort of an ambient space running around here. And then, of course, in this setup, well, there's this, this, this problem that arises, and that is, uh, that, is that, well, if, if I have some gamma, which is going to be a solution to the gradient flow um, problem, then I can also shift it in the domain by t and get another solution. And since I can do that, I have a whole R's family worth of, 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 reparameterza of reparameterizations of a single solution, which are sort of showing up here. But of course, you know, if we're doing more somology, we want to be able to count these things, so you kind of want to quotient out by them. And so how might you quotient out? And if you just sort of say, well, naively, what, what might I do? How about if I not try to do anything sort of too complicated? And what you do naively, I think one could consider doing is say, well, I choose a local patch of, I choose a local patch, um, uh, uh, or yeah, let's see. I choose a co-dimension one manifold, locally anyway, uh, near, the image of this, uh, near the image of this trajectory, uh, for which this trajectory crosses through transversely. And then what I can do is I can say, well, now what I can really do is say that uh, I can define B sub H to be equal to those gammas in, in B such that gamma of 0 is in H. And this sort of cuts down my domain a lot, right? This, this allows us to essentially choose, assuming that this point in here is, is, is injective, uh, and even when it's not, you can make appropriate uh, uh, modifications. Um, uh, this, this sort of cuts down your function space by exactly one dimension. In particular, what this, this looks like, at least point-wise, is that this is really B uh, mod R, where I'm thinking of R as sort of automorphisms of my domain, which in this case is R. So great, and so that's good. You can say, as it turns out, in fact, B sub H, you know, it has a nice Bonnock manifold structure to it. So you can uh, put a bundle over the top of it. You can talk about um, sections of the Fredholm sections of that bundle and show that the gradient, uh, the gradient equation essentially gives you a Fredholm section, and you can do perturbation, blah blah blah. You can do a fair amount of stuff at this point, right? But then, but then you say, okay, well, now the problem though is that I have essentially, I essentially have a Bonnock manifold which depends on my choice of H. So what you want to do is just sort of double check really quick that, well, you know, if it's the case that I chose a, a different H as my hypersurface, as in general there's, there's no, uh, there's no uh, natural or canonical choice of this hypersurface here, um, if that's the case, then well, let me just choose a different slice and then let me just go ahead and make sure that, you know, B sub H prime is well defined. So that, you know, that's fine, that's not an issue, and in fact this ends up being a nice Bonnock manifold too, right? And then you can say, well, this is a nice Bonnock manifold and this is a nice Bonnock manifold, so I should probably just check to make sure the transition maps are smooth. And so you say, well, I write down a transition map, so that's going to be something like uh, BH into BH prime, and it necessarily has to have a form of the following type. phi of gamma is equal to uh, gamma compose T sub gamma plus whatever, right? The point is that if I have one function, if one function uh, in, in, in B sub H, it maps, zero gets mapped into this hypersurface, I want to keep the same image and just shift that along so I reparameterize my domain so that now uh, gamma applied to zero is in H prime. So this is my transition map and that's no problem, and then you want to check to see that it's smooth and then you see that there is a problem. And the problem is that, well, if I differentiate with respect to gamma, well, this t, this t is sort of, a, this is a reparameterization action which depends up, upon gamma. So differentiate with respect to gamma means that I have to differentiate this function here with respect to gamma, but then the chain rule says I then have to differentiate the entire thing with respect to gamma. And now I'm in this scenario where I'm, in order to differentiate phi, I have to differentiate my argument. problem. That's exactly the problem we had with the first example that I gave, showing you that that was not classically differentiable. Right? Anytime you're in this sort of scenario where I have this function, I have a function defined between function spaces, and if it's the case that I have to, 
In order to differentiate that function, I have to differentiate the arguments of that function. That's going to be a problem for classical differentiability. Right? And so that shows up here. It, shows up, it showed up in the first problem. And effectively, it shows up in all moduli problems. Right? This, this is a problem that needs to be resolved. Right? Any questions about that so far? Yeah, what's your uh, fixation with C1? Why not just write C infinity? What's the Banach space structure on C infinity? So, so this is the problem. Yes. Right, so the, the point is, uh, so the point uh, running around here is that at the end of the day, you have this regularization, uh, this regularization idea that Katrin sort of, uh, that, that Katrin outlined. Um, and in order to do this, you say, well, you know, what do I really need to come out of that? I need some sort of implicit function theorem to show up. So whatever space I make use of, whatever ambient spaces uh, or bundles, whatever I use, I need, to have, I need to have an implicit function theorem at my disposal. And in order, the, the, the most, well, I think the most anal analytically easy setup to do that in is one in which you're dealing with Banach spaces, Banach manifolds, Banach bundles, and so forth. That's the easiest way. There's hard implicit function theorems that you can do, and they kind of, they, they share a number of similarities with things that HWZ have done. But my understanding is that you really want an implicit function theorem, and the, and the right way to have your implicit function theorem is coming from, uh, you know, considering Banach manifolds. Yes, Chris? The problem that you're illustrating would go away, I think, if you did things in a slightly different order and, and first restricted your attention to the space of actual gradient flow lines, like which is a manifold. And then if you, if you act on it with this, this reparameterization after that, you're fine because those things are smooth. So the question, so again. <coughs> of the order of things. Yes, yeah, so I suppose there's, there, there's also this issue of, of order. So, so yeah, so I, I think to, to reiterate essentially what Chris said, I think that if you consider your space of, if you consider essentially the space, your moduli space, whatever it might be, gradient flow lines in this example, more generally pseudo-holomorphic curves, you first consider that, and then consider the automorphism group acting on that, well, that is a smooth action, for sure. But then the difficulty is that what if, you, you, what if those spaces aren't cut out transversely? Well, then we need to have, uh, or they're not compact, right? If they might not be compact if you need to glue in uh, you know, nodal curves, for instance. They might not be compact because you have to glue in gradient, uh, broken trajectories, for instance. And now, now you want a larger sort of ambient space in which, to, to, in which you can sort of perturb and then have this essentially regularization theorem, as Catherine sort of suggested, right? So the fact is that because it's the case that we want to be able to, we want a large ambient space in order to make our perturbations, um, that, that's, why, that's essentially why I'm focused on, on, on this presentation. But that's probably a good point of clarification. Any other questions? Let me maybe make two remarks. The I'm already failing, it seems. No, no, no. This is <laughs> um, even if you take C infinity, really the question is what norm are you going to put on it? It doesn't matter whether it's complete or not. I challenge you to find a norm on C infinity in which this is different. And, and Chris's question is exactly why I spend so much time trying to say why we need to quotient first before we solve. So. Good, OK. So, so I'm going to spend a second here erasing. So if you have further questions, please raise them. You wouldn't get any mileage out of using a simplest space instead of C1, would you? Uh, no, I mean, I would say that you end up with all the same problems there. I just say, if you do it in the other order, so you solve the equation or some kind of fastened up equation first, and then so you have finite dimensional spaces, and then you quotient out, it's probably possible to do it, but it leads to all kinds of complications. I mean, that's sort of the Kronichi approach, which probably works, but it's, it's not easy. It's not straightforward. This is much more conceptually straightforward because you're putting a nice structure on an ambient space. So you don't have to piece lots of little bits together. You've got one whole object. 
And of course the downside, I mean, there is sort of a downside is that in order to do the polyfold approach, you, you do have to carry a lot of sort of analytic overhead with you. I mean, as you're going to see, you need to know about the SE calculus and retracts and some language and how the stuff all fits together. Conceptually, I think it is sort of easier uh, than, than uh, well, my understanding, it's easier than the, the, the various Kurenishi approaches. Um, but there is sort of additional overhead that you kind of have to keep track, with, uh, keep, keep track of as you go because of that. Um, good. So, okay, so there's, so there's this problem. So what's the solution? And so the idea, this was uh, HWZ's idea, uh, is to change the notion of differentiability. Differentiability. That's a C0 approximation. OK. Um, so how do we do that? So well, what we need is this definition of an SC Bonnock space. So I would say it's four things. A collection, really a sequence, of number this. Monarch spaces, E0, E1, E2, on and on it goes, as vector spaces, we have that E0 is contained in uh, e1, or contains E1, which contains E2, etc. Um, because we have containment in this way that you can't quite see, but we'll be able to see in just a second, the third condition is that E k plus 1, the inclusion now, is a compact embedding. And for uh, the infinity level, E infinity is defined to be equal to the intersection for k in the natural numbers of E k. Uh, is, as a property, is uh, dense in uh, each EK. So, so before trying to describe these properties, I think it's probably good to see some examples. So here they are. I'm going to try and keep this fairly simple and say, well, CK maps from S1 into R, which are real valued uh, maps from the circle. <coughs> Regularity CK, maps of Sobolev class WKP, sigma into, say, R2N. Yeah, RN, R2N, doesn't matter so much. Uh, say, P bigger than 2. Um, and then lastly, EK is equal to V for all K if dimension of V is finite. So here's some examples. Yeah, yeah, sigma's compact. This is a closed Riemann surface in this case, right? The sort of things you would want for gromov witten Okay, so, um, Right, okay, so good. So now the idea is, so the idea is somehow the first step is to replace uh, a Banach space, which is just this complete norm linear space, with this particular collection of complete norm li linear spaces which satisfies some properties, right? Some relationships. And what do I want to say? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll just leave it at that for the moment. So now, uh, so now I, I want to say, well, I, I said, let's see, 
that the idea was to change the notion of differentiability. So now we have to at least define what it means uh, to have continuous maps between scale Banach spaces. So here's the definition. F is a map, say, between E and F, which are SC Banach spaces. Is, so there's a couple different ways to say this. You can say either it's scale, and I should say, oh yeah, so, so SC sort of is shortened for scale, I guess. Scale because you have sort of this scale of Banach spaces, and this was terminology that was used by, I can't remember who it is, Helmut remembers, uh, but it was, it, was, it was terminology sort of in the literature, in, in, in literature elsewhere. Interpolation theory, thank you. Um, so you either say SC, or if you want to pronounce it scale, whatever, scale Banach spaces, this is an equivalent way to do it. These sort of conventions haven't completely been established yet. But in any case, this is SC continuous or SC, SC0 provided F maps uh, F maps EK into FK. Continuously, continuously for all k in the natural numbers. And so with my examples here, I think just to be sort of clear, as you might think of this as just one Banach space, I really want to I really want to think of this as a whole sequence, if perhaps that wasn't clear. And this is you know, the, the, sort of the constant sequence. Right? Good. So now we have a definition of continuity. Uh, we, can get to, uh, we can get to the definition of differentiability in just a second, but I have to mention a few properties first. So one property is that if you have one scale Banach space and you want to take the direct sum uh, with another scale Banach space, then the level structure is just sort of what you might expect it to be. Right. Uh, another property is that, well, given, given, given one scale space, you can actually construct some other scale spaces, um, essentially by forgetting a finite number of terms off the front end of the sequence, or the base end of the sequence. So in particular, I can define E superscript 1, so subscripts denote levels in your scale Banach space. Superscripts mean you sort of kill off uh, some finite number of, 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 of levels. So I can write this as E1, the kth level of the E1 space, assuming E is a SE Banach space, is equal to E1 plus K. And more generally, En K kth level of En is equal to En plus K. Right? So you can extract some others this way. What other properties do we have? Let's see. Maybe I'll just try and conserve board space and right over here. So three. This is more definition than property, but I'll list it here anyway, since it's a good place to. If U contained in E0 is an open set, then U has an SC structure given by U sub K is defined to be equal to U intersect EK. So I can point out that this issue here is at least slightly vague. I think, what does it mean to what does it mean to, to have an uh, an SC structure um, on sort of a topological space, which isn't a linear space? Uh, and I complained about this a lot to uh, Helmut and his co-authors, but they, they they never seemed to clarify this point. And then so then in in the user's guide that Katrin and, and Roman and, and Oliver and I wrote. Uh, we try to clarify this a little bit by bringing this notion of scale topology, and it's sort of interesting that you know, an attempt to make this less vague sort of makes the concept less clear. So 
I think the easiest thing to do is just allow this ambiguity and sort of say, well, kind of what's going on here is that having an open set in the sort of the base level of a, of a, of a scale Bonnock space uh, also ends up having this filtration. And it has a lot of sort of the nice features that you want to. There's sort of local properties anyway, sort of uh, 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 local, certain local properties are then induced onto these open sets. And it's best just to sort of leave it a little bit vague, I think. And the last property is that if the dimension of, say, your base level is, uh, is finite, then EK is equal to E0 for all k in n. This essentially has to do with the density requirement, uh, which is up over here. You need the infinity level to be dense. And the only way to do that with these finite dimensional vector spaces is if they're all the same. Right? OK, any questions so far? So now I need to do something a little bit strange. So I have to define the tangent bundle of E, which is some scale Bonnock space. And unfortunately, it's not what you would naturally think it should be. Um, in particular, maybe what I'll do, let me do the following, as this will show up. I want the tangent bundle of, a, of an open subset contained in some scale Bonnock space. So this is a little bit strange. I can just write it down. I write Tu is equal to U1 O plus E. So remember, the superscript 1 means we're sort of shifting the scale structure a bit. And you know, if you're following along, uh, then I think your natural question is to say, shouldn't this, you know, why isn't this equal to actually u o plus e? This is far more natural, I think. So here on this side here, this is the base. And this here is the tangent fibers. Right? And so this is simply kind of odd because now it means that your tangent bundle isn't defined everywhere. It's only defined at those points which, are, in some sense, are, are, have at least one level of regularity. So in other words, if, if, I, if I jump back to my examples, which have now been erased, I think, of uh, uh, what are some examples of scale Bonnock spaces? We said, for instance, um, the set of CK, real valued CK maps from the circle. And so now you can say, OK, suppose the base space is the set of continuous maps. What's the tangent bundle to this? Well, it's only the, the tangent. The tangent the tangent bundle, the base of the tangent bundle, is only defined at those points which are at least C1, not C0. So this is strange. And I can't really tell you why this is the right definition to take until I tell you about uh, what it means to be scale differentiable. And then this definition will become a bit more clear. So you should be confused. That's a good thing, I think, if you're confused, because you're at least following along enough to be confused. Yes? Uh, isn't that supposed to be the u prime plus e prime? No, that's another point. You'd also think that this would actually be e1 up here. But it's not. It's e0. It's also, it's also a C-bonus space, right? So it's like tuk is equal to u. So, so if I wanted to write down, if I wanted to write down, so I can, I can even be clear, right? If I want to write down what's the sort of bundle space, or what's the, the scale structure on this, well, then it has to be u1 plus k plus ek. Yes? I object to your kind of, uh, philosophical statement. I think it makes sense, because yeah, I mean, tangent space is the linear change. approximation. That's only going to make sense at one differentiable Um. But the, question would, but the question is, what are you, I mean, linear approximation to sort of to what? Right? It's a linear approximation. I mean. Right. This sort of implies, I think, the notion of, of, of a notion of differentiability, 
And we haven't talked about scale differentiability. That's what I said was sort of a necessary component in order to tell you why this definition makes sense. Right? In the back of our minds, yeah, we know that, you know, I mean, what's coming up, uh, what we'll see in a second here, is that the reparameterization action needs to be SC smooth. In particular, it needs to be at least SC1. And there, that's sort of a situation where I need to be able to differentiate this function, and in order to differentiate this function, I have to differentiate an argument, which means I have to lose regularity. And that's, I mean, that's essentially the key. I'll get to that in a second. I'll just restate it, I guess. Um, but that, I think, is the key idea as to why you need something, why you need something like this. Right? The other point is, if you're taking, in a traditional sense, you take a space of C1 max, and then you want to know what's a tangent space to that. Well, that actually consists of C1 sections of the bundle. So that's, I always find confusing, because you think the tangent space would consist of zero, zero sections. Mm. It doesn't consist of C1 sections. So the standard, this is really not the standard notion. But I have to say, this is where the key of SC calculus is. Yes. The fact that yeah. you have this new notion of differentiability because all the scale stuff was used, if you looked at old, uh, you know, implicit function theorems in KAM theory and stuff, they mm. used Sobolev space, scale to Sobolev space, but with the traditional notion of differentiability. And the whole point here is you've changed the notion of differentiality. That's what makes it new. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So should I think of this filtration as anything other than just increasing the amount of regularity? Is there any other example that... I don't know of any other examples. Helmut, Katrin? No, I think regularity is a good picture. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. And, and, and it, kind of, it also kind of makes sense, I think, as, as uh, you know, in terms of Fredholm theory, because you know, the, you know, the Fredholm sections, in particular, those arising from, from differential PDE, sort of elliptic PDE, um, you know, they behave nicely in between. Um, you know, they, they work nicely from, say, CK plus 1 to CK. Or, sorry, that's, that's a bad example. I'm sorry. Sobolev class, Sobolev regularity, you know, K plus 1 to, to Sobolev regularity um, uh, uh, K. And, and, and they do this for sort of arbitrary K, even though the map itself sort of doesn't change. So the fact that it works nicely across all these levels is also sort of an indicator of why it would kind of make sense to have, keep track of, this, of, of all this information, because it, it behaves nicely on the whole scale. Yes. So you said that we should let it as, let this, let it as uh, ambiguous, but, but what should I understand when, when you say you as an office of the C, SC structures? Just like a. Yeah, you, well, you have. Just like a filtration of, of the set, or, I mean. Well, it's, I mean, it's exactly what I've written. I, I don't, uh, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it's in some sense, I, I mean, in some sense, I would argue that what's happening here is because you have this sort of sequence of Bonnock space, se sequence of Bonnock spaces, that you really have a sequence of topologies, right? And and on different topological spaces, each of which is, is dense in the in in, in, uh, in in every other sort of a space is below it. Um, and so, and so, in some sense, that's kind of the way I see. I see this as just a, a sequence of sets all arising from having right a sequence of of of, of open sets all arising from um, from taking this intersection, uh, and they each have their own sort of topology. But the topologies sort of interact nicely in the same way that the the, the topologies in, in in the SC in the scale Bonnock space interact nicely. That's uh, that's about the best I can do. So when you talk about the direct sum of an open set yeah. with an SC Bonnock space, you mean like Cartesian product, sort of? Yeah. Uh, uh, helmet, what's the right notation here? I, I, it's, it's a product, yeah. is that the trait? It just Long indicates. I mean, it's just notation. It's U cross E versus particular filtrations. Yeah, maybe that's, yeah, yeah. Although, well, but it needs, it needs to have, so it needs to have a local notion of sort of some ability, it's an affine space or something. It needs this because that shows up in, in the definition of, uh, in the de definition of SC differentiable. So you can't just be the Cartesian product, product. It has to have sort of a local linear structure. If I take a point inside, I need to be able to add small point, uh, other small vectors and stay inside the space. Now maybe you didn't like that there's an open set on one side and a one up space on the other. Yeah. There's lots of things to not like about your definition, I think. But. But again, but, but I think that this is sort of a point where it, it really makes more sense to say, I mean, it makes more sense to tinker with this and sort of say, well, what's really meant? How is this being used? And then allow for the ambiguity there. Because if I try, yeah, again, if you try to make it precise, I think it gets messier and it becomes less clear what, what's really meant, right? So, so in particular, what I tend to do is just think that this U is actually an entire Bonnock space and then I'm just restricting myself to a neighborhood inside some larger Bonnock space, right? That's kind of what's going on. So
So now I think I can provide the definition here. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I had to erase that, but I can write that up again. Uh, definition, an SC continuous function F, which maps uh, U to V. Um, these are open sets in corresponding scale Bonnock spaces. Um, yeah. Is SC differentiable or SC1 provided? One for each x in U one, so have, they have to have a regularity at least one. There exists a bounded linear operator, which I will write as df, which depends upon your domain point x in bounded linear operators from E0 to F0 such that um, the limit as H goes to 0 in the 1 norm of F of x plus h minus f of x minus df at x in the h direction. Then all of that in the zero norm divided by h in the one norm is equal to zero. So that's going to be our first condition. condition In the map TF which is defined to map from TU into T V given by Tf uh, x comma h is equal to f of x, f of x um, df of x applied to h is sc zero. So, on um, one, you mean for each x in u1, right? Yes, that's what I've written. For, sorry, well, it says eek, but other than that uh, spelling error, it's x in u, and there is a subscript 1 there. And if it follows that df actually takes <coughs> ek to fk for all. ek, the, what does? That df, your, your linear map, your bounded linear operator, uh -huh. you said it takes e0 to f0, but in fact, the second condition implies it's got to take e k to fk. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, not necessarily. It depends on the regularity of x. If x is only on level 1, then uh, you can't say that, you can only say that over level 0. If x is on level 2, then df oh, will see. actually okay. level okay. 0 and level 1. Ah, if x okay. is smooth, then, it, then that's true. For I see. So, 
Any other questions about this? Can you say a few words about like what is going, like why why are we doing this stratification? But I mean, it seems like a lot of people don't really know what's going on. No, no. I, yes, I, I will. I will answer that question. Uh, um. So. So yeah, and I'm getting there in just a second. I, I want to add one bit of, of, of a one piece of information here uh, that I think was helpful is, is the first time I saw this. And by first time, I mean for several times I saw this. Um, you know, it just seems like this, this definition seems kind of technical. I'm looking at this, I have, you know, I'm looking at this, I just, I'm, I'm easily overwhelmed by too much information. And so this just looks complicated to me, right? So what the first, before moving on, the first thing I want to say is, I want to ask or perhaps remind us, you know, what is, or rather what, does it mean for a function to be differentiable? Well, you need two things. One, uh, you know, one you need um, um, an approximating linear map. And uh, two, it needs to, in some sense, vary continuously. Now, you have to make these notions precise, but this is the, these are the essential ideas in the classical setting. And I just wanted to make clear that that's exactly the same thing what I'm doing here. The first statement is guaranteeing the existence of a linear map, and it has to be an approximation to your function. At, at, or, sorry, yeah, an appro it has to yield an approximation to your function. That's essentially what this limit is saying. So this is, the first step is just guarantee the existence of approximating linear map, and then the second condition is essentially demanding that those things vary continuously in some sense. And our new notion of continuity, continuity is showing up making use of the scale, uh, scale continuity instead of, say, classical continuity, which would require something different, right? But if you, if you believe this in sort of the, the classical sense, then you should at least be able to stare at these two definitions and say, okay, well, I don't really understand all the, I don't understand everything that's going on, but at least I can see Condition one is an approximating linear map. Condition two is uh, saying that those linear maps vary continuously in some sense. Right? So now, so now uh, I can I can I can try to address your other question, which is, uh, you know, why are we doing this? And so. I think it's, it's instructive to consider a couple of examples. So the first example is to say, well, this is sort of a cheap example, but uh, it's useful to sort of consider. Define ek to be equal to ck plus 1. These are maps from, say, s1, real valued maps from the circle. fk is equal to ck s1 from r. Then, uh, um, um, f gets mapped to f prime, the derivative is sc1. Now, this is kind of a cheap example. This is kind of a cheap example uh, because it's classically differentiable. But that raises a good point, which is essentially that if you're if you have uh, if you have a function which is which is uh, which is scale continuous and is classically differentiable on every level, then it's going to be SC1. So essential, essentially classic differentiability, morally, classical differentiability is going to apply scale differentiability. So we are generalizing the notion of differentiability. But again, in terms of examples, this is kind of a cheap one. Let's do something more interesting. Yes? If, if, sorry, if ek is what? It, like in your previous previous example, ek is like s1 plus ck plus 1, and the map is just like, you know, re-parameterized. I'm doing that example right now. Okay. Look at the audience. I know. I think, I think that means it's a brilliant talk, right? That's the only thing you could possibly conclude. Well, I like brilliant. That's such a better... <laughs> so next time you say someone gave a brilliant lecture, we'll... <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's true. Um,
Right, so here's an example that we've already seen. Action by reparameterization. Did I make a mistake? Uh, yeah, I want a Bonox space just so I, I can, everything's compatible with the definitions that I provide. You can change it into S1, and then you work with sort of scaled manifolds, blah, 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 but I'll keep it as R for now. Um, uh, claim this is SC1. Right. Proof homework. And in the lecture notes that I have online, I provide some hints just to get, sort of get you in moving in the right direction. Um, but this is good to sort of work out. And so now, so now this is really important because. Joel, can I interrupt for a minute? Absolutely. Just to explain, because I would never be able to do this exercise if I didn't have a really big hint. And the really big hint is if you look at the definition at the top for what limit you're taking, the top of it you're taking in the zero norm, and you're dividing out by h, which is measured in the C1 norm. That's a crucial thing. So the C1 norm of h, of course, is much bigger than the C0 norm of it, because you've got the derivatives of it. So you're actually dividing by something which is much bigger, which tends to make the limit zero when it wasn't zero before. And it's that fact that you have the two scales in that limit there, which is making the thing work. And then you should be able to do the exercise if you actually, you know, you just read that and then you do a very simple case one has a hope of doing the exercise. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Um, right. <clears throat> so why is this example important? Um, So this then, goes, this then goes back to the very beginning, sort of the motivating example that we had. Right? The motivating example was, well, we had this, we had this function space, uh, and we had this reparameterization acting on it. And the key fact, I said the most important thing, that, or the, the, the thing which Katrin will tell you is the most important in my, in my talk, is that, is that this is not classically differentiable. It simply is not classically differentiable, and that causes a problem. And that causes a problem because it shows up any time you want to uh, write down, essentially, uh, any time you want to give a, a, something like a manifold structure to say, for instance, a, 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 a Bonnach space of maps modulo a reparameterization group acting, right? So this, sh this shows up anytime you try to write down transition maps. This sort of action by reparameterization shows up. It's not classically smooth. We need something else. And now this sort of tells you, at least in this toy case, that now this reparameterization action is actually SC differentiable. So now there's sort of a hope, right? And of course, the idea is that the, the things that make this um, SC1, for instance, also sort of tell you that the corresponding maps, if you're setting up, say, Morse homology, Fleur homology, gromov witten et cetera, et cetera, those types of reparameterization actions are also SC1. In fact, you can prove that they're SC smooth, right? So I can say, just give you sort of a quick definition then, is that, uh, is that F mapping from one, uh, say, uh, one SC Bonnock space to another is SCK if TF is SCK minus one, right? So if your derivative is sort of, you know, one what has one uh, uh, degree less of regularity. And so, so now I have to tell you something rather, so now we should sort of say something kind of important, I guess, which is, um, So the important thing, I guess, is that, so now what did we do? We sort of said, OK, look, it shows up a lot in these sort of moduli problems that you're going to have this action by reparameterization, and it's not classically smooth. But it is sort of now, it's sort of scale smooth. And so you should think, aha, you know, we've solved a big problem by just changing this notion of differentiability now. Instead of working with classically differentiable, we now have uh, the scale differentiable notion. And so it seems like everything should be great, but you can't celebrate yet. And the reason you can't celebrate yet is, well, if someone sort of says, look, I have a function that I'd like to think is differentiable, but in fact it's not, and, and, and then this person tells me, oh, but I changed the definition of, of differentiability, now everything's fine, you should say, uh, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> so what you really need is a, is a theorem, which is the following. Um, it's essentially the chain rule. So the chain rule says that if f is a map from E to f, and g is a map from f into, I ran out of letters. Well, let's say g, uh, then um, uh, uh, 
and let's say this is SC1, and this is also SC1, then uh, G, G compose F is SC1, and uh, T, uh, the, 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 cor the corresponding uh, tangent map of G compose F is actually TG compose TF. So exactly what you would expect. And now, now that you have the chain rule at your disposal, then essentially, then essentially anything from, say, finite dimensional differential, di differential ugh, anything from finite dimensional differential geometry, any construction that you can make there that doesn't involve the implicit function theorem, then carries over into the scale setting. So you can talk about scale manifolds, scale smooth manifolds. You can talk about scale differential functions between them. You can talk about, uh, you can put on scale differential forms. There's, there's quite a bit that you can do. And, then, and in particular, because it's the case I've erased it by now, that one of the key features of finite dimensional scale Banach spaces was that the scale was always constant. It turns out that any time you're dealing with finite dimensional manifolds, the scale calculus is just the classical calculus. So what we've really done is generalized uh, this notion of scale calculus from this classical setting from, uh, of, sorry, say, Banach manifolds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've generalized this notion of, 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 of classical differential geometry on Banach manifolds into these scale Banach manifolds with a chain rule and so that this action by reparameterization is now SC smooth. Sorry, but, but, but a question like, all, all this, unless I know that this gives me enough regularity to do the gluing that I want to do, then... So, so, the, so... It me nothing. I mean, you, you, I, I well, want to know that this is sufficiently regular to do the gluing that I want to do. So, so, so Katrin sort of said uh, that there are sort of two key features that, uh, you know, a smart graduate student, if they were given these sorts of things and locked in a basement for a year, I assume there's food and water and uh, oxygen being provided as well. Uh, uh, you know, one could sort of produce sort of the, the whole theory. And this is half the story. And sort of half the story is the first step is that even before you allow for breaking or anything, we have this problem. And the problem is that if I, the problem is that if I try to write down this quotient, Banach manifold of maps from R into a manifold between two critical points of a Morse function, and I try to quotient out by R, does that have a Banach manifold structure? Before you even talk about breaking, bubbling, anything else, does this have a Banach manifold structure? And the answer is no, but it has a scale Banach manifold structure. And so now, and, and, and exactly what we wanted to do before, right? What we wanted to do before was cut out by a hypersurface, and then you sort of say, well, if I cut out by two different hypersurfaces, are the transition maps smooth? Well, they're not classically smooth, but now they're, uh, they're scale smooth. And so, so now you're in this category where things look promising. And, uh, and so then what's the next concern that one has? Yeah, well, how about breaking and bubbling and gluing analysis and so forth? And that's essentially tomorrow's lecture. And how about the implicit function theorem? That seems like that's really important. So right, so Katrin would tell you that the sort of two key ingredients sort of uh, to, to, to the, the, the whole polyfold machinery that are sort of really new, I would say there's two and a half. And I would, I would say the Fred Holm theory actually constitutes a half. You really have to rethink what Fred Holm theory gives you in, in, the, uh, in the sort of uh, classical setting. And you have, to, you, have to, you have to provide sort of a different definition. I mean, something that defines the same thing for you in, in, the, in the classical setting, and then use that modified definition, which is sort of equivalent to the standard one. And you need to port that over into the sort of the, the polyfold scale calculus type framework. It, gets, it, does, it does get a bit more complicated. But there is a version of that, right? So, so as an organizer, I'm going to remind the speaker that I'm out of time. But I do want to mention just a couple of things, uh, which is that uh, uh, one looks at this, right? You look at this definition, and people are already sort of, I can tell people are already thinking about this. You look at this definition and say, oh my god, you know, how am I ever going to prove something is, is scale differential, is SC1, let alone scale infinity? And this looks really hard. This looks like something I don't ever want to do, right? Uh, and so, uh, to some extent, that should be true for most people, um, and, uh, and so, Right, but but yeah, like why is harder than the old notion of differentiability? Yeah. Pardon? Why is it more difficult than the old notion? Yeah, I think of that's already very hard. It's mm -hmm. as hard as well, that's and, and that's that's essentially that's essentially my point. If I said, look, here's a smooth function. Show this function is 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 smooth. It like is, is C infinity in a usual sense. What are you going to do? How are you going to do this? Right. Well, you know, you develop some basic maps. Right. You, you say, well, you know, I have some collect. You know, I have polynomials, for instance, and I've got you know sums, products, compositions, these sorts of things. And so you prove a little bit in, in each one of these cases. But look, you already have the chain rule at your disposal, and you already have that anything. Which 
which is classically smooth, is also essentially scale smooth, right? And so then, so then what happens when you're talking about proving things are sort of smooth? This gives you a lot of structure. And then, and then someone says, well, yeah, but if you're going to actually make use, really make use of sort of C infinity functions, which say aren't analytic, then you have to do one difficult thing. It's a one, this, you have to do this painful thing. And that painful thing is show that like cutoff functions are smooth, something which is constant for, you know, on an open set and then increases up to some, something else, right? So this is a hassle, and one does this. But then once you have this, now you have a ton of other things that you can do, right? Because you can interpolate between things, you can approximate, you have a lot of tools at your disposal. And so I would say that if you look in the HWZ SC smoothness paper, they essentially provide you all the build, they, they provide you many, many building blocks. Essentially, I would say all the essential building blocks that you need to prove that transition maps are, uh, are, uh, are essentially uh, uh, SC smooth in, in an appropriate sense. They, they give you the building blocks. And they, th those difficult things, like the analogy of sort of, um, how do you show that a cutoff function is classically C infinity? They, they have these sorts of arguments uh, in sort of, for these sorts of, of, of uh, you know, uh, building block type functions are SC smooth, uh, and these building block functions are the ones that always show up in pre-gluing maps, say for instance, right? And so lots of complicated, uh, lots, of, lots of transition maps, for instance, which should be, say, very complicated to prove are SC smooth. Once you break things apart into bits and pieces, you see that, that all the bits and pieces have been shown to be smooth uh, by, by HWZ already. So making use of this stuff is actually not as difficult as it might seem a priori. And uh, I was going to provide a list, but as I'm uh, almost 10 minutes over, uh, I'll simply say that uh, those, that list of sort of properties and references in the literature are in my lecture notes, which are online in the, on the website that I stated at the very beginning of class. And with that, I'll end. But I kept track of the time that I started, and I'm eight, and eight minutes over based on the time that I'm started. It's a shift function. It shows up a lot. <laughs> so any questions for the speaker? Yeah. Well, when you said the, the definition of uh, derivative, and you said that if you take uh, one norm of h, and that means that h is um, in E1, and uh, then the map, the differential maps E0 to F. So why do you need to have it on the whole uh, E0 space? Not um, just E1 space, or is it the matter of the norm? Or I, I, I don't see, I mean, I mean you're always using it on the which is e, basically E1. But I would say that the point is that if you look at this estimate, this estimate has to hold in the zero level. So it's sort of like saying, right, I've got a, a bounded linear map, and I'm sort of defining it on, you know, on some sort of dense set, for instance. But the bounds have to be corresponding to the zero level, not the one level. Pardon? The estimate is in F. Is it? You're taking one norm in F, so. I'm taking one, well, but of, of the numerator here, I'm taking the zero norm. So. But in F, I mean, the df x of h is in F zero, and not E zero. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think that the point is that the arguments that you're feeding into F are in E1, right? Yes, the, so the H is in E1, okay. And no, no, the H, H, no, no, the H is in that formula in H, in E0. Oh, and how do we know we can take the E1 norm of H? That's a definition. It's a linear operator from the zero level to, to E0 to F0. And you feed in, you can feed in uh, H in E0. <laughs> yes, uh, right, but the DF in, in one, yes, that's correct. There is H in, on the one level, but the operator itself goes from the zero level to the zero level. So DF of X of H, the H is on E0, makes sense because. That operate because it's a linear operator from the zero level to the zero. Well, well okay, I, I get that it makes no, sense. But because of density. No, maybe the, the it means that the thing has a continuous extension. So yes, yeah, so maybe the first question is why do we want this to go to the whole E zero and why don't we put it E one in the first place? Well, you you wouldn't get a chain rule if you would not, for example, require that D F of X goes from E zero to F zero. Ah, okay. There's no chain rule. Okay. I mean, the chain rule is a little bit of a miracle because you go by one step down with the first map, and then you go another step down with the second map. So, but the chain rule says you actually only have to go down by one step.
And that is only true because the embeddings from EK plus 1 into EK and for the same for F are compact. If you have just con continuous embeddings, it's wrong. Then you don't have a chain. So, so that you can't really re relax anything of this condition. Okay. Yeah, right. So maybe the answer is already in the, in the package one. So we, we showed if the three parameterizations is mm -hmm. C, C is not a, actually one. Okay. And the, the caution is based on the thing which is again a C, C uh, name right? for, right? Well, I, how, do you, how do you prove that? And the way you prove that, I would say, is by taking different cross slices and then, uh, and then showing transition maps are smooth. And then like in the second example. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I think so, yeah. And a naive question is like, so since it's like here, uh, modeling out reparameterizations and giving a space, certain, the resulting space, a certain structure that one can do calculus, is it possible to, like, doing something like a Morse theory in the space of strings using this, uh, this technology? Maybe it's kind of a very general question. Yeah, I don't have an answer to that, um, but... In general, I mean, I think that uh, in general, I think the SE calculus really hasn't been fully exploited. I mean, I think right now, you know, uh, everything that we're going to talk about certainly in the first week here is is really what is you know what is the analytic foundations that HWZ needed in order to do everything for SFT. So you say this is this is sort of what you need here, and based on the way pieces sort of fit together and the elements, you can sort of say, okay, well, if one really wanted to do you know, Fukai category stuff, or you know, uh, or you wanted to do relative SFT, or you want to start, or you want to sort of attach gradient flow lines to things. You know, that there's a lot of things which actually extend and fit into this nice framework. But even that, I think, doesn't fully doesn't fully exploit what what HWZ have done here. I mean, I think that there are a lot of theories, maybe outside of symplectic geometry, where this sort of stuff can actually be applicable. But you know, that's not being looked at so strongly at the moment because SFT first, and then everything else. All right, so I will rec recommend that any further questions be asked uh, later this evening or tomorrow. Let's thank Joel. <laughs>